I'm going to start recording as well. Okay, great. Okay, we are up on YouTube. Okay. Do you want to do any entertainment song and dance while people are coming in? <laughs> Ruar imitated owl calls. <laughs> of course he did. He's good at that. You must do some owl calls. Not so much anymore. <clears throat> I used to do a lot of spotted owl calls, you know, vocalizations, and then my voice got, it got harder for me uh, to do the vocalizations. And then I realized, like, why am I even trying? The, I can do the recordings with playback and so forth, and that's a lot crisper and cleaner, and then they know more about what they're talking about, and and so I'm, I'm just a poor imitation for that. So, yeah, so this, I kind of get this is just for entertainment purposes for humans. Yeah, I see. I know. Yeah, it'd be real entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you want to do some uh, some owl calls? Sure. Any, any in particular? Well, you have to do barred owl. Of course. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's oh, really oh, good. oh, 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 oh. Uh, screech owl. Let's see if I can actually do this one. <clears throat> yeah, that's good. That's what I heard when I was 11 years old. Uh, and it was on, sitting on my tent, that whinny call. It was the whinny that the screech owl was doing on top that of your is, tent? Yes. Yeah. Oh. I can remember Fantastic. that very distinctly. Yeah, it was impressive. So you were just in a pup tent and it was sitting right on top of? On the tent, yeah. I was inside. It was outside. I was just, it was just far away <laughs> and I could just see it vibrate each time it called. Yeah. That was nice. Okay, well, I think we've got a bunch of people here, so I assume they'll keep coming, but I'll just get started with the intro. So that was just to give people a little bit of time to keep coming and, and getting here because I know technology can be fun to work through to get into something like this. Um, so thank you all who have registered and are coming and are joining for the, us for this presentation. Um, I am enjoying these very, very much because I always love learning more about owls from people who know way more than me about owls. So I'm glad that all of you can join us for this. Um, a little bit about the International Owl Center, if you're not familiar with us. We're located in Houston, Minnesota, the sprawling metropolis of less than a thousand people. And people always say, why on earth do you have an International Owl Center out in the middle of no place? And the answer is it evolved in Houston. We never decided to do an owl center. We started with a nature center and Alice the Great Horned Owl, who if you hear an owl hooting in the background, that's Alice. She's 23 and retired now. But I started using her for education programs. She was the star of the show. And I thought, well, hey, let's do a hatch day party for her in early March, somewhere around when she hatched. Let's call it an owl festival. We'll bring in some speakers. We'll do some fun family things. And the first year, 300 people showed up, which for us in winter is a big deal. We kept doing it and then pretty soon Hundreds more people started coming. We added a World Owl Hall of Fame where we present awards to people from around the world who have done amazing things to make the world a better place for owls. And David Johnson, of course, is one of those award winners. And so we had people coming from all over the world, some of the top owl people on the planet coming to Houston to speak and receive their awards. So then we really got known for owls. And we, when we started getting more than a thousand people coming, kind of dawned on us, we have people flying here from all over the country to little bitty Houston, Minnesota. So there's probably a bunch that don't want to um, come to Houston in early March to learn about owls. So we decided at that point to start an international owl center because Minnesota also has a wolf center, uh, an eagle center, a bear center, um, working on a loon center, a trout center. Wisconsin has a crane center. So we thought, hey, let's do an owl center. And, and that's kind of how we got started in Houston. Um, our mission is to make the world a better place for owls 
through education and research. So education is kind of primarily what we do, and this is certainly a part of it. Um, normally we're doing in-person programs at the OWL Center that has changed with COVID. So we're staying at home um, just like a whole lot of you are. Um, and for those of you who weren't here right at the beginning, this is being recorded. Uh, you will not show up in the recording, only the active speaker and whoever is actively talking will show up in the recorder, uh, in the recording, uh, which will be saved to YouTube on our YouTube channel. So if you go into YouTube and search for International Owl Center, you'll find our channel and you'll find this recording, which is being live streamed right now to YouTube also. If you have questions at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A. And if you click on that, you can type in your questions. We found out last week that people have a lot of questions and we don't have time to answer all of them. Um, last week we did an hour of questions and didn't get to them all. So just be aware that we may not be able to answer all the questions. We will take them at the end of the presentation and Joe and I will take turns asking David the questions. Um, this program, because these are free, they are sponsored and paid for by donations. And so to get things going, I did a birthday Facebook fundraiser um, and that sponsored our first two programs. So this program is sponsored by Pam Daimler, Aaron Dorbin, Charlene Ebel, Roseanne Yoakum, Mike Schmidt, Susan Odson, Teresa Tews, Sam Lay, and Ulrika Kantner. Um, we have already signed up these are the ones that registered, people from 19 different countries and 39 states. So people are really coming from all over the place um, to join in, which is fantastic because we couldn't reach that many people if we were doing programs just in our center physically. So we're very thankful to have David Johnson here with us. He's the director of the Global Owl Project. Um, he lives in Virginia in the United States. He grew up in a farm, uh, in a farm, in Minnesota on a farm um, about three hours west of Houston. And some of you may have heard his first experience where he was chosen by the owls um, to study owls. So David, if you wanna talk about that a little bit, but he's been in the natural resource field for 46 years and working internationally with owls since 2001. So I will turn it over to David. Very good. <clears throat> Thanks, Carla. So I think, um, so I've had a chance to work with owls in, in many different places around the world, and it's been an honor to have, since 2005, led the Global Owl Project. We have about 450 people that are participating in the science and conservation of owls. Uh, university professors, museum curators, passionate volunteers, masters and PhD students. And so um, it's a wonderful group of people. Um, I've been involved with owls since I was young. Uh, when I was 11, an eastern screech owl. I didn't, at the time, I didn't know what it was, but it was an owl. I knew that. It came and landed on my tent, and it sat on the outside of the tent in the moonlight. I could see its shadow just this little ways from me. I was inside the tent, and it called, and it called for 20 minutes, and I could see it vibrate with each of its calls. And then I realized, you know, it could sit in the trees anywhere around there, but it was sitting on my tent and on the moonlit end of the tent. And so I could tell then it was a special message. And so after that, owls, I saw owls and found their nests and found them, saw them, their sign, all, a lot. And it was like a constant companions and friends. So now I can say easily that I didn't pick owls, they picked me. And so I've been working with uh, owls in conservation uh, since I could in my adulthood, in my career. Uh, and I'll do that until my last breath. It'll be a, a wonderful life with owls. Yeah. So one of the projects with the, the global owl effort is involved in owls and myth and culture. And that's what you folks are signed up for today. I'm gonna put on the screen share here. Here we go. And uh, we'll try to go right to the slideshow. There we go. All right. Uh, so I want to share with you some of the things that we've learned over the last, I guess, 10, 10 or 11 years now uh, about owls and myth and culture. Um, and so I've taken the perspective of, 
uh, there's lots of folklore and lots of talk about owls uh, and you can find any number of things uh, on the web and so forth. But uh, the idea is that uh, I want to get down to some more factual information about owls. What really is going on with this perspective? And so the idea here, the premise is what people believe about owls worldwide makes a difference in how they conserve and protect owls. All right, well, that seems rational. Um, very fine. So what do they really believe? If you strip away all the other junk mail out there about uh, stories and so forth that may or may not be true, uh, what do they really believe? And so my focus has been here with this effort, more facts and less folklore, please. And so that's what I really want to do is look at the evidence. So in this talk, I want to explore two core aspects, the evidence of the human owl relationship, and then societal aspects that shape our beliefs about owls. How, why is it that we think the way we do and how, do we, uh, how does that affect conservation and what can we do about it in, in for, the, for owls, um, to advance owls and the role of owls in the, in the world. Okay, so the human owl relationship is based on personal interviews, which I'm, and I'll spend a good chunk of the time in this presentation on this topic here. Uh, interviews, uh, presence of owl related products in society, these are marketing things. Um, and anthropological, archeological and paleontological evidence. All right, take a deep, deep dive. And then other aspects that shape our beliefs about owls. Certainly societies and cultural beliefs change. Well, how, exactly how do they change? Um, and they change through aspects of law enforcement, okay, uh, community government leaders and change agents, uh, educational programs. And I think the role of grandmothers is important in the transmission of cultural norms. And so we'll, we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit more as we go here. A little bit of housekeeping. Uh, you'll hear presentations in this uh, talk about the, the time, archeological dates. BP is before present. And this is in the paleontological time frame. And present is accepted as 1950, the year 1950, okay? Uh, BCE before the common era is the same thing as BC, like before Christ. Um, and then CE is the common era, and that's essentially after death. The idea here between BCE and CE is to step away from Christianity. Not everybody believes in Christianity, but certainly we can use common dates for archeological evidence, and we need to have a common language for that, huh? So that's what these are, BP, BCE, CE, okay. There are, at this point in time, 257 recognized species of owls in the world. And this is a map of one, from one of my students, uh, and we plotted the species richness of owls. And if you can see in my cursor here in the lower right hand side, the numbers of species for given areas, there's none in the Antarctic uh, and there's none up here in parts of uh, Greenland and so forth. Um, there are one to three species and then the richest 15 to 19 species in some very uh, localized areas. The idea here is that owls are top predators. They're not dense in terms of species, any particular place. There's not a lot of room at the top if you're a top predator, huh? okay. But this gives you a sense, they're all over the earth and they've evolved uh, through a very long period of time uh, and, and they're found everywhere. So in essentially all societies as well, okay. Um, the majority of people have, uh, don't see owls very much. And when they do, it's something like this. Um, it's a, a startling event. Um, if not startling, it's, a, it's something that people remember. Often people will recount in, in very good detail, the first owl they ever saw, yeah. like my first one that landed on my tent. Huh? I can remember very much about it. And so um, as compared to other birds, you know, the robins or jays or something, you don't remember your first one. And in fact, they don't hardly count on the register, but owls certainly do. Yeah. 
the human owl relationship goes very deep in time. And this is a, essentially a finger painting in the Chauvet cave in France. It's uh, dated to 30,000 years ago. And so it's one of the oldest uh, artworks or is the oldest artwork of owls that we now know of. And so the belief here is that it, this is a long-eared owl or an eagle owl, one of those two. Uh, um, but it's a depiction. And like you'll see with a lot of the owls, is it's looking at you. Okay, um, many of the artifacts about owls and so forth, the owl is invariably looking at you. And in fact, in real life, most often the owl sees you before you see it. This is a part of some work from uh, uh, Veronica, a woman from France who's done some incredibly detailed work about examining uh, owls, in, in this case, snowy owls in the Magdalenian period. So 14,000 to 21,000 years ago, yeah. And in the what she was able to find is that, uh, of course, people were hunting them for meat, uh, but they also used a lot of the talons. See this here, and the wings. Um, and it, that certainly is more than just meat and provisions. Huh? And the way you can tell that is because you can see cut marks human cut marks with stone tools on the, on the bones themselves. And so she was able to, um, through 56 sites in France, uh, look at the amount of snowy owls uh, in this uh, very long ago period and recognize, of course, the symbolism. Owl, people were using owls for symbolism as well as just for food. Uh, with the wings. And there's a site in, in Gibraltar in Spain, uh, Spain, where they found something like 500 snowy owl wings. Not the carcasses, just the wings. Um, and so there was a substantial effort uh, to, to use snowy owls. Now, this is during the last glaciation, so it's not any... Uh, I was thinking maybe it was starting to get warm and they were using the wings for fans. I don't know. But uh, Anyway, the, there's a long human relationship with snowy owls in particular. Yeah. Here's, I'm gonna go through some slides that talk about other, other artifacts and other aspects uh, of, snowy, uh, of owls. The one on the left here is one from uh, a couple thousand years ago. Uh, this is bronze. It's a wine vessel, okay, from China. Here's a mortuary pole. This was a, a wooden pole carving and it was, uh, upright along the a river and it was believed that it held up a deck essentially or a platform that was a, a cemetery above the water where people were uh, where people had died and were placed there and it was also a symbol uh, in a, a very recognizable marker if you will to other tribes that were coming through there that this is a tribe here uh, that is very, very active. This is, uh, you're entering tribal lands and this is another marker of that. Huh? But it was clearly a, an owl. Huh? These are the Nazca lines in Peru. Uh, this is about 500 meters, a little bit more. Uh, this is an owl. They have plenty of talons back then. Uh, but of course, this is a, a, a small line that shows up from from a, from the aerial, and so uh, one of one of the many things down there, uh, a lot of symbolism and a large scale uh, geographical aspect there. This is a ceramic vessel uh, of an owl uh, from from Peru, from Nazca. Again, uh, one thing I want to mention is that. Uh, you'll see a lot of the owls, ceramics and so forth with ear tufts, feather tufts, um, and the big round eyes and so forth. So they, and they're forward looking, huh? And uh, it, it makes it clear to whoever is handling it and so forth, this is an owl, there's no question about it. And it's a pretty clear demarcation about what it is that's being represented here. Don't have dates on these, but these petroglyphs, this is a speedus owl from the Pacific Northwest of the USA, uh, Oregon, Washington, okay? 
Um, and these are petroglyphs often uh, inscribed in the rocks by shamans. Yeah. Uh, here's another one. This is from the southwestern U.S. Um, here's some artifacts of an owl. Uh, we often lose the context about who made this and why, but they certainly spent a lot of time doing it. Yeah. And so these things are important uh, markers. Uh, but also that they identify the human owl relationship. Yeah. This is more current day, of course. Uh, this is a young man. He's got eagle owl flank feathers in his uh, fancy dress. Um, and so it's to, the eagle owl's flank feathers are used. Uh, they're spirit helpers and they keep you healthy, uh, wealthy and uh, in good shape and they're protectorate. Yeah. So you'll see more about this as we go along here in the presentation. They'll tie some flank feathers on their motorcycles on the handles, again, as a protectorate. You know, you could wear a helmet if you want to, but you can use eagle owl feather work better, I guess, huh? So, but the, the flank feathers are, again, there as a protectorate. And they'll put them on their car in the rear view mirror and on, the, on their horse tails and so forth. This is a coat of arms from Corusha from in Portugal. Uh, thank you, Inish. Um, and so it's a city that has little owls here, and it's a, a city marker from a very long time. Symbolism. Uh, I'm, I don't spend a lot of time on this kind of work in this presentation. But certainly there's tons of uh, symbolism and iconography. Um, used about owls uh, in many societies around the earth. Also use uh, the symbol of the owl in, in security. Uh, this is Ulan. Uh, it's a little owl. This is, this is actually in Mexico, this photo that I took here. Um, and so the owl sees all. Huh? And uh, so that's the, uh, that's the role of the owls here in symbolism for these uh, security people. Well, uh, that's not always how owls are viewed. Uh, still in Senegal, uh, owls are very bad news. And it's uh, about witchcraft. The owls are associated with the night and with things that you can't see and the power of, of that. Huh? Uh, likewise, we have the wise owl on the right hand side here. And so some societies view them like this uh, because they're studious and they are always watching and, the, and they're silent or quiet. And so they learn, they're learned. Yeah. I had a chance to spend some time in the Smithsonian in the American Indian Museum to look at the artifacts, uh, several hundreds of artifacts to, and to help with some feather identification but it was a, 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 an incredible honor to go through the museum and to look at some of the 7,000 or 8,000 artifacts. Um, and many of those were related to owls. They had things like these in there. there here's an, uh, a silver owl from Peru. Here's an owl bottle, uh, ceramic, uh, much older one. But again, the, the large eyes here, in, the, in this case, the feather tufts, uh, clearly indicate owl. Yeah. These are great horned owl feather dress. Uh, very nice beading in the, in the leather here. Uh, and so this is a tail uh, uh, in wings of, of a great horned owl. This is from an immature female snowy owl. These are hand uh, hand masks that you use when you're dancing to connect with the spirit of the owl. This is from Inuit, uh, northwestern Alaska, and uh, helps you connect with the spirit of the owl, and, uh, to, and they're again a, a helping spirit. Yeah. Many of you have seen photographs or, uh, or sometimes you actually may be seen, these, this spectacular magnificent golden eagle headdresses that were worn by senior chiefs or very senior members of various tribes uh, of people, uh, Indians in the United States, Canada, or other places. Huh? Uh, and so these are golden eagle feathers. I mean, this is a very special, very uh, significant 
uh, adornment. Huh? But what you don't see here, you, you, you're mesmerized by all of this fantastic work and the power that these represent. What you don't see is that inside the back is a whole bunch of great horned owl feathers. Ah, uh, this is from Lakota in South Dakota. Yeah, but there was many of these headdresses had great horned owl feathers or owl feathers, a great horned owl in particular, on the backside, and you rarely saw them, and they never got written up, and so it's that this is a golden eagle headdress with ermine and other things, but when I saw these, I said, you don't, you don't have it on your inventory, but there's a whole bunch of great horned owl feathers too here, so they represent the power of the night. As part of the work we did with the myth and culture, we've we've you know you're obligated to do a literature search and so we wanted to explore the details of publications from around the world we've done our best job that we can there's more to do of course but in the bibliography we've got 756 publications right now we have actual pdfs of maybe 600 of them and we're trying to get copies you know physical pdfs of the rest they remain largely in books uh, but uh, as we bring these together, there's four kinds of things that step out of this. There's the archaeology, the artifacts and physical remains, the description is like some of the things I've been showing you. Um, there's beliefs. There's some owls that are associated with the religion, the Medellin religion from the, the, the uh, folks in northeastern Minnesota and Michigan uh, tribal. There's some ceremonies, rituals, deities. We'll see a little bit of that. There's folklore, uh, the myths, the stories, poetry, uh, legends, um, and the iconography, the art of the sculpture, the owls on coins, the coats of arms, uh, things of that sort. Um, so we haven't yet gone through and formally identified these four things, but we are, we are identifying which of the literature pieces we find are actually the primary literature in which are secondary literature, uh, so that we can better say, if you're looking for owls in myth and culture, or you're looking for owls in the human relationship, this is the hardcore list of primary literature you need to be concerned about. This is the factual stuff that we really want to base our, our, our descriptions and discussions on. So uh, beliefs about owls have an impact. Yes, of course, lots of myths and beliefs and stories. So what do people really believe? How much do they really know about owl ecology? All right. So that was one of the main motivators of this project. So we wanted to examine it, explore it in an unbiased, kind of a scientifically focused way by conducting interviews. All right. So we've done interviews, uh, 30 countries uh, we've been around with. We used 24 of these countries use the Global Owl Project interview form. Uh, four other countries uh, used other interview data, uh, very similar to ours. Uh, and then we had two other countries with cultural data. Collectively, if you put all that stuff together, uh, we had about 5,200 uh, interviews with the Global Owl Project form, and then uh, other interviews from other countries, Pakistan, Gambia, Ethiopia, so forth, uh, Mexico, for a little over 7,000 interviews. And so we've tried to make a sincere effort to actually ask people uh, and random people, not targeted people. We want to make it unbiased. You get a sense here as to where people are from that we did the interviews with. Here's a map that just shows those countries. We tried to orient it a little bit. Um, they were not selected specifically. We wanted to find places where we could do the interviews. So folks, uh, uh, there were people that say, oh, yeah, I'll be a team leader for, <clears throat> uh, for South Africa or someplace uh, or in Mexico or Brazil. Um, so folks did the interviews in these various countries. And so we're very appreciative for them to step forward and uh, organize such big efforts. The interviews focused on four different topic areas. The first one is the basic information about the person themselves. Are they male or female? What age category were they in? Uh, where were they born? 
uh, what kind of language do they speak? Uh, then the next one is kind of general knowledge about owls themselves, the habitats, nest, diet. How many species can they identify? Where the owls live? Uh, okay. Third one is, of course, attitudes about owls. Are owl spirits? Are they real birds? There's some places that uh, the answers were no, they're not real birds. They're shape shifting spirits that take the shape of an owl when they want to, but they're not real birds. Uh, but, what do you believe about them? Uh, do you know any stories? And actually, do you believe the stories? Should owls be protected? How do you feel? You get the idea here. And then the last one is additional aspects. Uh, have you eaten owl meat or anyone you know? Used owl feathers, bones, or eggs? And uh, how does the culture view, why does the culture view owls the way they do? So these are the kinds of questions we ask. And we had this four page interview form. It's kind of standard interviewing uh, it's categorical. Uh, most of it was not text, uh, just so that we could reinterpret it correctly. Uh, instead of trying to say what are they really trying to say here in their text, sometimes text is hard to read uh, in all these languages. So we put together this interview form. All right. Um, so, so we've had folks, uh, the uh, gentleman down here in Belize, upper left and upper right, Aleph, Aleph and Ferenc, uh, our man here in Syria, uh, who actually has unfortunately been killed because of the conflict in Syria. He was shot, um, Adwan Shihab, uh, Mingma over here uh, on the right hand side in, in Mongo Northwestern China. Uh, but you get the idea, these are, very patient, understanding, and energetic people uh, who have done these kinds of interviews uh, in various locations in the field, um, essentially asking random people and people, uh, so many they obviously don't know. Um, so we try to make the interviews one interview per family. Uh, try not to ask biologists because they're biased, okay, about owls. Are they? Well, not really, as it turns out. Um, uh, but rather just general people. Um, and so the uh, intention was we tried to interview about 200 people or more per, per country, per area, region, if you will, because it, we find that if we only interview a few, uh, the discrepancy or the noise in the data isn't statistically uh, uh, strong enough. So 200 or more, then you get an asymptote and more doesn't really change your answers all that much. Here you can see kind of a sense uh, as to the women in the blue, the, how many women we interviewed, 51% were women, 48% were men and 1% didn't want to specify. Um, and so, but it gives you a sense, huh? how many we people, people we interviewed. This is with the Global Owl Project form. And collectively, how old were they? Well, we interviewed a few, just a few kids, uh, 12 to 17, then an 18 and a higher. And so a few people didn't want to specify their age, not very many. Um, but you get a sense as to who uh, or how old were the people that we interviewed. Huh? And so, because what we're trying to do is get a, a reasonable cross section of the of the population for the various countries, um, and make it representative. I think we did a good job here. I'm going to dive into this a little bit more. I'm going to give you a little time to look at these. So you'll see the same sorts of four countries: Belize, Serbia, Argentina, and Iran. In the next several slides. This gives you a sense as to the age category of the people from Belize, from Serbia, from Argentina, from Iran, okay? So, all right, uh, interesting. Uh, it gives you a sense as to who we asked, okay? Uh, we asked the same, uh, same folks, uh, where do owls live? Well, forests was a big, uh, and of course, Belize is mostly forested, so it makes sense, but they also said that, okay. Serbia, a similar thing, um, uh, but Argentina, yes, okay. Iran, okay. What do you believe about owls? Powerful spirits, wise, creator beings, scary, dangerous, bad omens or bring bad luck. 
that was a that was a prominent one in Belize. In Serbia, it was that they're wise. They're just birds. They they're helpful. They'll bring good luck. Okay. Argentina, the majority of folks clearly said they're just birds. Uh, in Iran, they're wise. They're bad omens or bring bad luck. They're just birds. Hmm, that's interesting. That's a real kind of a mixed response of sorts, but okay. Um, the idea is not to pass judgment, just accept that's what it is. Yeah, okay. So overall, for the Global Owl Project interviews, this is what we found is that in majority were owls were considered wise, but more of them were cons people consider them just birds. There's powerful spirits, creator beings, scary, dangerous, bring bad luck, bring good luck. Okay, uh, helpful for medicine. Uh, so that was inter interesting kind of the, the, this is the global perspective. Huh? When we ask people, <clears throat> do you know any myths or stories about uh, legends about owls? 30% of them said yes. 54% said, no, I don't know any myths or legends. Some were not sure, some didn't give us a response. 30% said yes. Okay, well, that's interesting. Then describe what they were. All right, they did that. Then we said, do you believe it yourself? Only 26% of those of that 30% said, yes, I believe that story. No, I don't believe it. 60% of them said they knew a story, but they didn't believe it. Some were not sure and some didn't give a response to it. Okay. Uh, it was interesting. I've had a couple of folks that were that I interviewed that said owls and myths and legends, but I don't know if it's true or not. Can you tell me? You're the expert. <laughs> and so it was interesting that, you know, some folks honestly didn't know, but they had heard it a long time and they knew stories about it. These two question answers to these two questions are, this gives you a range by the different countries, but this gives you a mean, okay? They're powerful spirits, they're wise. Now you just saw this in a different sort of graph. There's some places that owls are really bad, bad omens or bring bad luck, okay? And some are scary and dangerous. Well, they go hand in hand. Uh, and so uh, creator beings, helpful for medicine, you know, bring good luck, yeah. Uh, do you know a story or legend? Okay, this is what we saw before. Owls important for the environment. How about that? And even if they thought owls were dangerous or bad omens, they still thought owls should be protected. And in fact, 83% of the people we interviewed felt that owls should be protected. Because they recognize, I think, that the role of owls in the environment and the role of owls in societies. And even if they're not uh, desirable, they still feel positive about owls. That was interesting. And it, that's an important finding uh, for owls in conservation. Well, I took, I wanted to scrape a little bit more. I said, using that interview data from the, th and other information from the 30 countries, um, did they have a positive view from a conservation perspective? Um, so 12 had a positive view, eight were pretty neutral, um, just birds, uh, nine countries had a negative view. All right. Further, uh, six countries indicated there was positive momentum in underlying cultural beliefs. That is, they were changing. The cultural beliefs were changing. 24 countries, it looked like by all the indications, there's no, there's been no recent change in beliefs. You know, the re recent being like in the last 150, 200 years. One of the things that we realize is that one of the indicators for changes in societies is the amount of merchandise, all related merchandise in societies. Okay, so is it a, it's a it can be a barometer about how owls are viewed. Okay. If there's really no or few owl related items, uh, it's because in businesses, schools, and institutions view owls with negative connotations. Other regions where there are many, many owl related items logos are found indicates a broader acceptance of owls. Um, the actual sale of real owls or parts of owls complicates this, of course. Huh? Um, Alif took these pictures in Turkey. Uh, and here are some uh, planters uh, for cacti. 
uh, some jewelry, some clothing, um, backpacks or other uh, carriage uh, luggage materials. So the sense there was, even though owls may not be viewed so positively, there is a lot of owl related merchandise in the marketplace. So this tells you that somebody's buying this stuff and um, shopkeepers are willing to carry it because it's something that people will buy and so there's access acceptance of it. We did our interviews and so forth in, in, in Belize. Most of the Mayan people believe that if an owl calls during the night, it indicates that someone will die in the village. But it also indicates a significant, it can signify good luck to hunters or fishermen. And when we did the interviews, then I found a publication from uh, Brinton in 1890, 1880s. He was a linguist and he described the language, Mayan language, uh, to science. And he described uh, the word owl and he, and he stated that uh, if an owl calls, it means uh, someone will get sick or die, uh, it, but it's also good luck to hunters or fishermen. It was essentially word for word what people indicated on their interview forms. And that was in the 1880s. And so here we are 140 years later. And it really, the belief hasn't changed one millimeter about owls in all that time. So uh, we also found out that spear thrower owl, he, he was a real person. He was the ruler of Teotihuacan. Um, and so there are real people associated with, but that's not really a commonplace belief now. Uh, is documented, uh, obviously, uh, he, but he's a real person. And, okay. So when, if the owls are bad luck, okay, uh, we went out to look for merchandise in the Belize marketplaces. And after two years of searching, they found two items, this kid's backpack and this slate carving. Those were the two things. So obviously in Belize, uh, owls are not well appreciated. Uh, and so no merchandise is really av readily available. Yeah. Well, it makes sense, but it's a good indicator uh, of uh, the broader acceptance. Yeah. In China, <clears throat> Ma Ming and others found the tremendous use of eagle owl uh, Eurasian eagle owl, booba booba, they're flank feathers. This is in a wedding uh, dress. It, these are family heirlooms, as it turns out. Flank feathers, flank feathers, flank feathers. Okay, you get the idea. Um, because they help keep the person healthy, wealthy, uh, in good condition, and they're protectorates. And so, that, but these are really a commonplace thing. Uh, when I asked some of the people about where you get all these eagle owl flank feathers, and they said, well, we used to hunt them, or the kids used to go out and get them from nests. But now since the power lines have gone in, we can walk out and we can find them underneath the power poles because the owls are getting electrocuted. So that was a bad thing. Uh, but the important part of this is that there's a widespread acceptance about the value of eagle owls. Well, that has a mixed blessing, okay? Um, they're helpful, here we are, Belize, Northwestern China, about all helpful or bring good luck, bingo. Uh, sometimes folks think they're bad luck, scary, dangerous, powerful spirits, for sure. Just birds, helpful for medicine. Uh, when we got down to the part of the question, have you or someone you know killed an owl? Well, 120 responders said yes. Um, maybe that's not a surprise. But certainly here's a youngster, it's commonplace to have yeah, eagle owls, huh? uh, eagle owl parts. In, in Greece, we're, you know, it's been popularized or if, from my perspective, it's very commonplace about the goddess Athena and how she's holding a little owl that was her consort. Um, and in the back of the Tetradrachm uh, from 500 to 40 BCE, uh, the silver, the owls on the back side of the coin, uh, we're, we're familiar with the little owl that's in that emblem. Well, uh, Vasilios went, went through all of the Greek history, the 11 different periods of Greek history, and examined how the owl was viewed 
in each of these different periods, well, things radically change from time to time. The part of the archaic and classical period is when the goddess Athena and the, the silver coin uh, with a little owl on it, that was the heyday for that. But early on in the Greek Bronze Age, <clears throat> in the Minoan Age, these were owl stamps that went on to casks and other merchandise that were on the sailing ships for trade. Okay, and so there was an owl stamp along with turtle and a few other stamps too, but they indicated kind of ownership or proprietary aspects about it. So, but the point is <clears throat> things radically change about the beliefs about owls in a given point in time. So here's the Greek coin. Of course, now this is 2002, the Euro, the Greek Euro, the one Euro coin has this, the same little owl. I, I don't know that it holds the same sort of popular value that a, a silver owl did back then. Um, but the, the point of it is, is that people try to, in societies, try to hang on to good things, you know, or re, reinvigorate uh, popular beliefs and so forth. Well, in this case, an owl. Suruchi Pandey <clears throat> from India has done some really fantastic uh, work, her and her husband and their team there in, in India. Um, she has translated a lot of the Sanskrit literature that dealt with wildlife, and in particular owls, um, and talks about the value of owls, the acceptance of owls, and so forth. This is Sanskrit. Um, and here we are today. Um, this is 2016, uh, but the Lord Ganesh here uh, with the owl behind behind him, um, party down, huh? Uh, so this is a big time celebration. The goddess Lakshmi, she's the goddess of wealth. She has an owl here as her consort and too. So it's helped symbolize uh, wealth and wisdom um, so forth. So. Uh, Owls are well represented. Well, that comes, it's a mixed blessing uh, too, because um, owls are because of it, Diwali. Diwali is a celebration, and I think it's coming up, uh, or was recently in uh, November. So um, a lot of owls are sold uh, into uh, the people buy them and then they sacrifice them. Um, and if you're the goddess of Lakshmi, with the owl, if you're wealthy and you want to, uh, if you're not wealthy and you want to become wealthy, then sacrifice an owl. If you are wealthy and you want to retain your wealth, sacrifice an owl. Um, and so it brings you good luck and fortune and uh, and so forth. Um, and so uh, they will go to the extreme of using food coloring to dye the owl's eyes. Okay and they will glue on extra feathers to make a small species look like a big species, a bigger species, because it has more value. And so this is, this is a, uh, a problem in conservation and they're doing what they can to help overcome this uh, through education and, and policing and so forth. But it's a big battle uh, and uphill work. Yeah? Well, that's how we get into some of this stuff. This is Paul Marithi, he's in Kenya. And uh, he, this is a Mackinder's Eagle Owl sign. And he, he has been uh, conducting ecotourism in Kenya, taking people out to see the eagle owls and other birds. And he gives some of his proceeds to the local farmers to help protect the owl sites. So it's a win-win. And it's the kind of thing that uh, helps, helps him personally, but it helps the owls and helps the local farmers. It's a very good thing. And he has been one of our award winners for the, the International Owl Hall of Fame because of it. You know, he's doing some good work. Well, it turns out that when he was looking at that eagle owl site and other eagle owl sites or other owl sites in Kenya, he's finding out that the eggs were disappearing. It turns out people were watching him and others go to these owl nest sites and they would steal the eggs. When, in, when it, there's more middle income people in Kenya and when one of the family members was sick or dying of AIDS or cancer, they often would go to Tanzania 
and visit a witch doctor. Uh, and the doctor there would uh, recommend uh, the, the use of an owl egg to, for, for medical recovery. So middlemen then would go out to these eagle owl nest sites or owl nest sites and take the eggs and then sell them. And the prices they were getting, they are getting are exorbitant. And this is a serious conservation issue uh, in Kenya and probably in Tanzania, but in Kenya in particular. So um, the prices here, <clears throat> each owl egg was expected to fetch about 3,800 US dollars, about $89 a gram. The cost of ivory in China in 2015 was $1.10 a gram. And that of rhino horn in Vietnam in 2016 was $35 a gram. So owl eggs cost more than twice the price of rhino horn and about 80 times the price of ivory. This is a serious issue. And this is one that you really have to be careful about trying to investigate uh, and um, apprehend poachers and so forth. So we have a conservation issue that we need because it's a giant vacuum of owl eggs across the, the countryside now. So it's a big deal. They're so powerful that the owls, when they go to the nest, the owl's eggs are sprinkled with maize, cornflour, and then subsequently collected with the, without touching them directly. They're picked up with a black and white cloth and then taken to the, uh, taken to the, the buyer. Yeah. And so that's how this kind of works out. So a lot of the myth and culture stuff in conservation is about reducing risk. Okay, we can't really eliminate risk. We can reduce risk incrementally. Um, and so how do we do that? Well, one of the things we do around the countries is we have laws and law enforcement. So many of the countries have protective laws about owls and many since the 1970s. The concern of course is their enforcement. And so uh, there's convention on international trade and is aimed to ensure international trade with wild animals doesn't threaten their survival. Well, we've got some examples where it does in owls. So illegal trade and traditional medicine are the real conservation issues here. And so, all right, law enforcement is one of those things. There's a paper that was uh, quantifying the legal trade, not illegal, the legal trade over the last 40 years about owls. And so here's where some of, here's the source areas and uh, where they're going. Yeah. Japan has quite a, purchased quite a few owls. They come from other countries. Uh, but the idea is that we can document the legal trade, all right, and use that as an example of how, how things should be done or can be done. And does it have any effect and so forth? Okay, we have to give some kind of alternative rather than just saying no or legally, yeah, okay. But so this is one option. But the thing that concerns us most is when there's uh, big, uh, big arrests or confiscations of large numbers of owls you know, or special owls. Here's one in uh, Malaysia, uh, almost 800 carcasses of barn owls. These were meant for food, okay. Um, and so uh, there's big, big trade going on. This is 44 live eagle owls were found in a car. Now these are alive, all kind of in ace bandages. They were bound for the traditional medicine market in China. In Nepal, that there is a big illegal trade of eagle owls and other owls, but eagle owls in particular. Uh, a grandmother in Nepal would raise a young eagle owl to its full size and then a middleman would come and buy it for about 5,000 US dollars. And then it would go through uh, the trade route to get to China. So the, the policeman here in China called me up and they said, what do you think we should do with all these eagle owls? I said, well, the, the point was that they're probably not local. They could be from very far away. So take them to the edge of town and release them. So they did. Well, some of them sat on their police cars and so forth, and it was kind of fun to see what they're doing. But obviously, they were, uh, you know, what do you do with these kinds of live, uh, live birds? These are major predators, huh? 
Um, so I told them they didn't catch the guy. They, they caught his car and all the eagle owls in it. I said, if you ever catch that guy, tell me, because I want to hire him for the Global Owl Project. He certainly knows his ways around owls. And so they, those are the kinds of people we want to turn into advocates for owl conservation because they certainly know the ways around owls. Owls are used in traditional medicine in China. Here's a recipe uh, for, this is a scops owl, Otis scops, um, and how you use it uh, in, in the particular function here is to uh, nourish your yin, relieve colds and nervousness, detoxicate, heals dizziness, epilepsy, scrofula, I didn't even know what scrofula was, malaria and choking. And uh, it goes into detail about how to prepare it. Uh, either you can cook it with ash, burn it down to ashes and use that, or you can eat the meat and so forth. But either way, you need to take off the feathers and degut it. Yeah? So, but I have recipes like this for three other different species, and it's for different ailments. You know? But there are some <clears throat> uh, real life traditional medicine things going on with these. Yeah? This is in Kazakhstan, Kazakh, and this is a fetish market. Here is a, a long-eared owl. Here's eagle owl feet, uh, eagle owl feathers here, along with any uh, sundry other things, golden eagle you know, parts and so forth. Um, uh, this one is in Tome Logo, uh, Africa. This is another fetish market. You can buy owls here uh, for various ailments, uh, medicine or healing powers or for witchcraft. Uh, so they are uh, uh, markets. Uh, there's birds and owls in the illegal trade here in Indonesia. I don't know what these owls are being sold for, um, but that's, they're, it's kind of a common place. You can see in the backdrop here is a, it's a big bird market, songbirds uh, in, in particular, but you can buy most anything. Huh? So, okay, uh, to help change, make the change. Laws and enforcement is one issue. Another one is community and governmental leaders. Uh, we need to elect officials who can make important changes. Um, there are programs for capacity building and campaign development and for emergence, emerging wildlife conservation leaders. And folks recognize in the nonprofit world and in, 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 in the governmental world that we really need to do this for wildlife. Um, there's mentorships and award programs to support people who are passionate about wildlife conservation. Yeah. Um, as yet, we, you know, Jane Goodall is a fantastic spokesperson for primary primates in particular and conservation biodiversity. We don't have an owl person like this yet, uh, but we need you. And I know you're out there, so we're cheering you on. Come forward. You can speak up. We'll cheer you on. We need your help. Education. <clears throat> uh, there's, of course, there's a lot of education about owls, and there's ways to do it that are more successful. In Belize, uh, the director of the Belize Zoo said she had been teaching kids about owls for 25 plus years, but didn't feel like she was getting any traction. She was teaching about owl biology, owl ecology, pellets. Uh, turns out that then I said, let's do the interviews. And you, I think you get the idea about some of the interviews that we found. The point was that the beliefs in Belize haven't changed. So unless you're dealing in educational forums that help change the beliefs, you're not going to have traction. Ah, okay. So here we go. Uh, pellet dissection, uh, evening owl prowls like Carla does. Uh, people for, gives chances for people to actually hear, hear owls experience nature uh, but we need to go through just beyond owl biology, and we need to have a strong cultural component, which is partly what this whole project is trying to do is that, okay, that's fine to say that. What do you really mean by that? Okay, so this is in, in uh, Aruba. Uh, thank you, Armando, for your fantastic painting and for Sitska and Guillen and others that are doing such fantastic work down there. Um, 
and so the, in, this is the Shoko, S-H-O-C-O. That's the name of, that's the uh, uh, papamento word for owl, burrowing owl in this case. Uh, and so we think it's actually a full species and we're working on it to find out if that's in fact truth. Uh, this is not the actual size, okay? Uh, but you get the point. Uh, the, so the Shoko is uh, viewed positively through our interviews that Sitska did. Uh, it, it, it's uh, in, in conservation in Aruba. And so we're trying to do some things with it there. So you can have owl education for little kids and for older kids. And so uh, we did a workshop, a field training, and this was a, an old golf course. <clears throat> And I had, we had the, the students come out and we said, okay, we had an in-course train, in, in classroom training session in the field. And I said, I want you to find every single burrow out here for this burrowing owls, because the Shoko's nest in burrows. And when you do, I want you to measure all the details about these burrows. And then we'll come and investigate to see if there's really owls in there. And this, this San Nicolas golf course, uh, is the most valuable place for shokos on Aruba. And so it's a significant place and there are something like uh, 14 or 15 pairs that nest here. It's a significant thing. But the point here is that if you involve students in educational per, uh, aspects, you need to continue to, to uh, involve them. And so they can get a chance to really immerse themselves and refresh themselves about the value of education and the role that it plays with owls. Huh? So importantly though, and we need to take on into account the, the beliefs about owls. And so uh, understanding what owls represent, good, bad, or otherwise. Yeah? Um, in Zimbabwe, uh, in Zambia, sorry here, uh, one of the best things I've seen that's come out is, is an Owls Want Loving. It's a publication and they use it in the, the schools to teach. Yeah. And I can send this to you or make it available. But it's the idea that uh, it, it deals head on with the beliefs about owls in, in a country that views them negatively, views owls negatively. But it just says, you know, here's one of the beliefs. It's not really true. Here's what is true, okay, uh, as an educational component to a curriculum. Another aspect <clears throat> that's valuable to societies and how we transmit cultural information is through grandmothers. Now, this might be a little harder for us these days because of COVID in particular, and we're not really associated with many of our grandmothers. But in a traditional sense, we've often uh, been in close-knit families, closer-knit families uh, with extended families in the same household or nearby. And so mothers get too busy with the day-to-day -day upbringing activities of the kids, but the grandmothers have more time to discuss the cultural nuances. And we found too that women are more have more beliefs about owls, spiritual, are more spiritual and have maybe a little less ecological knowledge, but more spiritual, cultural knowledge, uh, beliefs about owls. Yeah? So of course, this uh, is based on the, the perspective of indigenous peoples and the values, the views and values, true, true values of elders and grandparents, indigenous cultures around the world view elders as the cornerstones of society and family life. Of course, they're the most experienced uh, and, they, and they've got something to say. It's of value and importance to us. So much so that in uh, South Korea, they've uh, developed programs now, Story Grandma, uh, training in Tory, in Tory uh, orientation. These, these are genuine grandmothers. Uh, they're typically 55 to 70 years old. Uh, most of them have been school teachers, uh, not all, but a majority have, but they go into a year and a half training program to become story grandmas, to learn about cultural aspects of Korea, and then uh, to go out into classrooms with young children and teach them. Well, wouldn't that be neat if we could do that with owls, uh, that we could have story grandmothers. And so, um, 
Linda from South Africa. She is awesome. I, I love her to pieces. Uh, she's one of the great team of folks in South Africa. Uh, and so she decided to give this a go. She taught young children about owls. Uh, she taught middle-aged folks about owls, older age women, and then grandmothers. Uh, she herself, I think, is about 35 years old. And uh, so she gave it a go. <clears throat> South Africa is a place where owls are not viewed positively. And so this was an uphill swing. She said, I had had the opportunity to engage with different age groups of women in the rural area of Kuala Zutal Natal here in South Africa. Believe you me, owl mythology is very prevalent here. Yes, the oldest, the eldest women did hear and understand what I had to say, but it was not easy for them to accept. The middle ages women's response was moderate and with the younger adults, it was fascinating. Then it came with the children and it was a jackpot. She felt, she told me, she says, I just felt like I ran into a buzzsaw with the older women. And she says, we could try doing that a bit more, but it's not simple. I must say, I did, plea, I did plea to them that even if I cannot change their minds, they must at least not pass on the fear onto their grandchildren. Wow. Okay. Um, they liked the owl pellets, okay, and doing that work. But what it tells me and tells us is that it's probably not a good thing to send a 35-year-old woman into a 70-year-old 70, group of women and try to teach them about owl beliefs. We'll need to do that with a peer, someone who else is 70 and senior and respected in the community, if we're gonna have half a chance. And so, but it's also just the tip of the iceberg in what it really means to try to tackle these kinds of issues. You know, it's a significant thing. And I have so much appreciate her efforts in trying in Delinda's work in trying to make this happen. So, well, are there examples of success? What success would really look like in the owls and myth and culture, okay? We wish owls would have uh, a lot of respect. They'd be seen as equals and they'd be valued, okay? Are there any good examples that we should, can use, should use to help guide us? Yeah? I found five, I wanna share with you five. There are more, but there's five here that I wanna share with all. First one is a Gordal, the owl site in North Central Australia. And this is where the, where the local Wardaman tribe is, uh, is where the earth started, you know, right there. And Gordal, the owl started it. Uh, there's a Gogomat site uh, in Southwestern Australia, a sacred site. Um, Blackestine's fish owl is, is essentially, the translation of it is emperor of the night for the Anyu people in Hokkaido, Japan. There's Owl Mountain is a sacred site in Mongolia it's for women only. And then a, a discussion uh, and some time I spent with a shaman, uh, Isaiah from the Umatilla tribe uh, in, concerning the equality of all things. Huh? So the first one, uh, North Central Australia, the Gordal site uh, is a rock shelter site and uh, is Gordal, the owl, is the creator being who started the earth. Uh, Bill Harney took me out there uh, and it's a large dome-shaped rock uh, with a perfectly round rock perched on top. Amazing, you thought you could just touch it and would roll off. You know, around the base of it, all of the rock is gouged and scratched. And I was trying to figure out why, why that was like that, uh, okay? And underneath part of one, one portion of it, there was a rock spall and painted on the ceiling of that about a, three feet off the ground was a two meter long, perfectly white painted Taito owl. And, and Bill said, you know, you're the only second white guy we've ever had out here. The first white guy came out and he dated this painting and he said it was 1,500 years old. And he tapped, Bill taps you on the shoulder and he says, and heck, that's just when it was last updated. And so anyways, this was where the, where the earth started. Uh, so all the scratching was because, because people come here, have come here to thank Gordal for a good year and hope for a good year next year. And it's such a powerful place that they want to take a little bit of the dust home with them. Just a little bit. It's really powerful. So they scratch and take a little bit of the dust. And that's over the last 40,000 years, that's where all this gouging came from. Yeah. 
And I asked Bill, I said, so do you think the Wardham and Tribe and others uh, really value owls? And he just kind of stood there and he looked at me like, haven't you heard a thing said? Said, Of course, you know. So respect for owls is profound and unapproachable. There's no, I mean, the creator being started the earth. Of course, they'd have that profound respect. That would be hard to do in other places, but it gives you some pla- a sense that in places, it is valued that way. Owls are valued that way. <clears throat> this is the Gogo Mat site. <clears throat> Stone Owl is a sacred and powerful creator, healer, and destroyer. It's an ancestral and living spirit that must be protected at all times. So it's overlooking the valley. Um, and so the concern that they're having, and part of the reason I got involved is because there's a mining operation back here. And all the activity is, the concern is that this rock, shaped like an owl, a Google Mat owl, can vibrate off because of all the blasting and stuff going on here. So they've tried to uh, keep a safe distance and government uh, keep a safe distance because this is a, a sacred site for the native peoples. Yeah? Okay. So here it's a, a living spirit, you know, a protectorate, um, but it can have, if you, if you run afoul, it can have bad consequences too. So you got to behave yourself. In Hokkaido, uh, the blackest teens fish owl is considered to be a god who defends the village, a god of the village or emperor of the night huh? uh, for the Anyu people. It was, re- most, it was regarded as the most important god and thus the Anyu people lived in harmony with the owl along river valleys where they both depended on fish, salmon in particular, but fish in general. And so um, this is the largest owl in the world. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, but it's a very sacred owl. And so they still have sacred ceremonies f- for the spirits of owls to send the spirits of gods back to the divine realm. So there's this interconnection with divineness uh, and spirits and owls. Huh? The Lake Akan Anyu Theater <clears throat> works to ensure the history and culture of the native Japanese Anyu. They're the native peoples of Japan. And so um, this is a good example of, well, you can see the owl here in front of the building. Uh, and so a profound respect for owls and their relationship to people. This is a woman from Mongolia. She's a shaman. I met her in Barcelona. Uh, I saw her eagle flank feathers in the back of her hat. And I walked up behind her and her entourage saw me and she turned around and I said, hi, I introduced myself. I'm David Johnson and I saw your eagle flank feathers and I'm impressed. Uh, And I wanted to talk with you about owls. And she looks at me and she says, Yes, I know. And it kind of looks like, whoa, it scared me a little bit. But she, she's a very senior shaman for the uh, woman there. And she was telling me about owls and how profoundly respected they are, uh, helping spirits. This is Mongolia. Huh? And this was where she told me of the site uh, that's Owl Mountain. And the men can only go as, the, as far as the parking lot. And uh, then women, here we go, uh, only women were allowed to visit. Men could only go as far as the parking lot. Women would conduct vision quests and spiritual visits to the mountain. So the traditional ways of worshiping and protecting sacred places are the best way to care for nature. And so each mountain stream and river and lake has its own deity, okay? Male and female, respected and feared, okay? You get the idea of the profound respect uh, that animals and objects are they're endowed with and so uh, this is powerful stuff and this is a good example for us about how to hold things in value you know there's actually a textbook uh, six pages of this textbook from the russian far east are dedicated to shamans six pages are dedicated dedicated to owls and shamanism here in from the russian far east it's basically a community textbook, college. In the Americas, uh, here in North America and here in South America, shamans, 
uh, were the ones that primarily interacted with owls. Uh, and here, split great horned owl feathers. Here again, split great horned owl or Magellanic, uh, Magellanic horned owls uh, feathers <clears throat> signify that this was a person, a shaman uh, of, of significance, of importance, uh, because he is the one that can deal with the power of owls and help help to corral or or integrate with owls. I met a, uh, he's, I think he's 38. <clears throat> this is Isaiah Welsh. He's, he's, he's a practicing shaman of the Umatilla tribe in Oregon. Um, we met uh, at one of the sites I was doing owl work on. And the, the general sense of when you ask tribal people in the U.S. about their owls. They usually say they're bad luck. Um, you, know, you shouldn't mess with them. Uh, they're, they're dangerous and so forth. But the shamans have a different relationship with them. When I had an 18-year-old uh, young man from the Umatilla tribes, not a shaman, I asked him, what would you do if you actually saw an owl? And he said, he immediately did this. He says, I would try not to make eye contact because you're just asking for trouble. And so he didn't really want to see any. He's willing to go out and do the work, but he didn't really want to see any owls. Well, Isaiah is a different story here. So the first day that I met him, we talked about owls and so forth. And he said, yeah, the, the tribe has a song about owls. That's all he said. Uh, we worked together for the day. The second day that he came out, uh, he said, um, the song is actually about a young boy who gets separated from his group. Uh, the group says, well, we're going to move on. You better come along. Uh, and he doesn't, and he stays behind, and he gets left behind. Uh, the owl comes at night or at, toward evening and says, if you'll be strong, I'll lead you back to your people. Uh, and the owl does that, and the boy is reunited with his family. Um, and so that's what he told me on the second day. On the third day, he sang the song to me in the Umatilla language. It was moving. But it also tells me that, of course, over the last many thousands of years, tribal people have a deep regards and affiliation with owls. And if you just ask a simple question, how do you view owls? You're going to get the simple answer. But it's much more complicated than that. And we need to have the, the resiliency and patience to re really learn about it. As we were working on the depot, on the study area, I said, you know, Isaiah, there's one plant here that, that I really don't seem to get along with. It's called a puncture vine. And it has very sharp spikes. And it gets into everything. And I said, I really have trouble warming up to this one. And he looked at me and he says, it probably thinks the same about you. And I, so it was this profound equality that he was just simply transmitting about how other things are equal. We're just one, one part of the universe and we're equal to all the other living things and uh, so forth. So um, that's a perspective not many people share yet about how, how we interact with owls. But myth and culture wise and conservation wise, that's one of the leadership things I found that we, I'd like to portray in advance. So here's some perspectives, uh, just kind of a more toward a wrap up thing. But uh, here's a young boy. He's got eagle owl flank feathers. He lives in this yurt here in Mongolia. Huh? Okay. We find artifacts <clears throat> and we are not always sure what they are, but it's a good place to start looking, of course. This is a necklace. Okay. Uh, and there's a little hole here for the string and it goes around your neck. It's an owl. It's upside down. It's because that way, when you're looking down, they always the owl is always up looking at you and protecting you. This is Clinket from Northwestern uh, USA, Canada. This is a, a speaking staff of an owl uh, from Macaw. This is North Washington, USA. Uh, this is an owl drum. It's probably one meter tall. It's a big drum. Uh, from the Pacific Northwest. So 
there's many aspects about owls and artifacts that can teach us things. We just have to be patient enough, thoughtful enough to, to look and listen. There's real life at current day activities going on. These, this is uh, Inuit from the Northwest and they wear these masks to animals that the mask represents here, a case of short-eared owls. Uh, this is in Burkina Faso, the right-hand side. Uh, these are dancers that are dressed, uh, two of them as owls and their job for the celebratory weekend once a year is to dance and chase away the spirits of people who have died during the course of the year so that there's no more trouble for them from them so no more uh, dead people worries yeah and that's the job of the owls to chase away the spirits of people who have died current day burkina faso <clears throat> so i hope that i can help to illustrate here that animals can no longer be regarded as merely, merely living with people, but they're actually co-constituted, they're, they're equals to us, yeah? And it's a fundamental belief uh, perspective, yeah, that uh, I hope we can teach in our educational programs as we move beyond owl ecology, owl pellets and so forth, but the profound respect for, for owl that way. So, uh, so cultural variations, of course, all around the world, uh, and so that he, they accumulate in a society through time, and they evolve complex cultural adaptations. Um, anthropological and psychological research tells us that cultures will rarely change quickly. So deviation from social norms can be costly, and results in pressure against rapid personal change. What we found in our interviews is, you know, essentially 80% of people in a given culture kind of all believe the same thing. It's because it's costly to, to not believe that, okay? And especially if it doesn't really matter. So the perspectives like that. So the predominance is to get along. You know, we want to get along in societies. So, so the human all relationship goes back very deep in time. Uh, and the, the human all relations have been and should be fashioned by a shared sense of place. So this approach characterizes human animal interfaces as coming together. Human and owls are equal and each have a right to exist. Society, the cultural values really do change and they can change. And here uh, in the US, 1692, 16 people were hanged or pressed to death by rocks in Salem, Massachusetts for being witches, but now we dress up on Halloween we, and we mock the whole process. We drop up, dress up as, Hall as witches now. In our interviews, uh, the <clears throat> predominant responses from in Iran, this was in Iran, um, for the older folks there uh, was that owls are bad news. They're bad luck. And if they come to your house and call, it means someone will get sick or die. And when we asked the younger people about their beliefs, they said, oh yeah, I know the restaurant, Boof. Boof is a restaurant chain, uh, food stores, and uh, there are 14 of these in Iran. And here is the corporate headquarters, okay? And they have an owl symbol here. Uh, and it's a Boof, which is the Persian word for owl, big owl, eagle owl, yeah? And Boof is what they sound like. So it's an onomatopoeic. Um, one of the older gentlemen, 70 something, uh, when we did the interview, he said, oh yeah, uh, the owls are bad news and bad luck. If they come to your house and call, someone will get sick or die. Or if they stay long enough, the house itself will turn to ruins. Well, the owl that most people see in Iran is the little owl in the lower left and it nests in abandoned buildings. So this chap, believe that the owl itself was the cause of the abandoned building and this rather than an owl, okay? But, all right, that's a powerful belief. But here we are, no formal owl science education programs in the school curriculum. Um, now owls are viewed as a quaint remembrance of the past. They no longer have the power they once did, but everybody recognizes them. So it's okay to have a restaurant. 
if it, if owls are really bad news and bad luck, you wouldn't name a restaurant chain after them. You know? So here's a cultural uh, uh, situation where cultures are actually changing. You know? uh, in Malaysia, barn owl nest boxes are going up in the palm oil plantations for rodent control. And so the use of bio uh, biomediation, if you will, uh, is a big thing in many parts of the world, but in, in, in Malaysia in particular, and in, in Israel and other places too. So the use of owls. Yeah. This is in, these are Jor Jordanians and uh, Palestinians and Israelis, and they're the use of barn owls. The uh, there are barn owls that have been found going across the border. Uh, saying we need owls, we need barn owls uh, to help control rodents, and it's part of our shared destiny. So there are efforts in a in a, such a major conflict zone to try to have uh, sponsors of peace, yeah? and the barn owl is one of them. And so this is in Nepal. Uh, owl conservation camps, and I here I want to recognize Raju and Yadav for their really fantastic work. They've held many hundreds of these owl conservation camps, and it has had in since 2012 when they first started, and has significantly advanced uh, owl community awareness and education and so forth. And this is some really hard work. But this is a good example of, of conservation and education work in action. And this year they came out uh, with an owl conservation action plan for Nepal. So all of this kind of work is heavy lifting and so forth, but it can end up in a positive context for owl conservation. So it's a long-term effort, education and so forth, care, patience, and honesty, uh, trust is essential. This is heavy lifting for societies. So don't expect rapid changes. Trust so that it can be done. People are doing it. So learn, respect, and apply the local languages. That's how folks interact the most. You know, you're not an outsider. One of the things, interviews, that I found most intriguing to me, and it really touched my heart, was one that Priscilla uh, from Brazil, hi Priscilla, uh, when in her interviews, she asked a, a 41 to 50 year old woman from Southern Brazil and about the reason their culture viewed the owls the way it did. And she, says, uh, and it, she responded in Portuguese here. And then the translation, the direct translation in English is because they simply enchant the environment. And I thought, what a nice, eloquent way to say it. And I was touched by that. So Priscilla, thank you for that one. Uh, and for, for the good work that's been done there. Thank you to Bruce Marco. He's my co-lead on all of this and uh, almost 200 people that have been involved in the Owl Myth and Culture Project uh, directly uh, doing interviews and compiling things and so forth. Thank you. And so I thank you to the audience. Uh, I know that there's people from at least 19 or something countries and 40 states and more. And so thank you for your time today uh, and for all of your efforts. And so uh, we're gonna put together the Owls and Myth and Culture as a published as a volume. It'll come out in the Journal of Ethnobiology, um, the Global Owl Project. The, the website has been up for 15 years and then got hacked and so we shut it down to, and we're now getting it back up on its feet again. But uh, we have the Facebook page up and going, uh, my email address if you wanna touch with me directly. But uh, I think this is where Carla, I come back to you. And so now we can take questions. Wonderful, thank you very much, David. I always learn a ton when you do presentations and uh, especially that quote at the end was fantastic because people always ask me, what is it about owls? And I think that kind of hits the nail on the head. They enchant the environment. Um, we have, oh, before I forget, um, if we could have um, people post, we have staff and volunteers that are helping both in our Zoom chat and in our YouTube chat. Um, 
you have David has a link where you can make a donation to the Global Owl Project that's going to help with this publication um, and the rest of this project. And I think that's being posted in chat. So if you're in Zoom, um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat button um, and you can open that up. It'll get posted in there. Um, but we should start with questions. And uh, there are a variety of questions that came in, so we'll just kind of um, jump through these. I'm going to ask some questions. Joe Severson, one of our educators at the OWL Center, is going to ask some other questions and we'll kind of tag team this. Um, how did people hunt owls for meat in the past? Do you know the methods that they used for hunting the meat? I, I don't know, but I, I can assume that they're going to use various nets, spears, uh, bow and arrow, kinds of uh, basic, basic tools now. And so uh, the owls that were captured in the, in the French area <clears throat> were not juveniles. We know they were adults. Uh, and so they were not youngsters that they were finding nesting in that area because we can tell by the bones that they're not juveniles. So there's some, they could be, you know, they're fledged, fledged certainly flight capable birds. So they had to hunt them. It wasn't they could walk up there and get them. There's a question about feather arrangement and meaning. I believe this was referring to the uh, the eagle, the uh, golden eagle headdress. Uh, they said, I learned that owl feathers had specific meanings. Is this correct? Yes, 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 yes. So um, there, uh, the for a moment, uh, the flank feathers from Mongolia and Northwestern China are, are specific uh, to the the, the body feathers are specific uh, as compared to other feathers. Uh, but in the eagle headdress, the golden eagle headdress, those were primaries and secondaries, mostly secondaries. Um, and in some other headdresses, they were tail feathers of the great horned owls. Okay. Um, I think that they were such that they would, well, I'm, I'm going to speculate, okay, uh, that the, those feathers were used because they could flutter and you could tie them in. Uh, into the headdress. Um, uh, beyond that, I, I better not say because I'll, I'll probably get it wrong and I don't want to do that. And so, uh, but there were, there's, you can imagine with that kind of headdress that everything is very specific. And there's a reason for the feathers that were selected in the exact arrangement of them. And I, I'm sorry that I don't know more about what that is, but we should assume that uh, it was all carefully arranged. Okay, next question. Um, you referred to a bibliography of like a gazillion publications you put together. Is that available someplace? Um, not yet, uh, but it will be. Uh, it's going to be one of the chapters, that entire bibliography. Um, it'll be a chapter in the Owls and Myth and Culture monograph that will be published in 2021 by the Journal of Ethnobiology. And so uh, if the person uh, has, a, or if folks have a specific request for that bibliography, because you're planning on doing key work with that, then contact me directly. Uh, we'll see what we can work out. Because my intention here is to share all of this stuff. Because what good does it do if we don't share it? Uh, we, we need this in the collective sense. Yeah, and so, uh, so, uh, so there we are. Huh? It's in it right now. the The bibliography is an Excel file that has a citation. It has the the description of the project, abstract, and so forth, and then the keywords, and then whether I have it as a PDF or not. Yeah. So there we are. Along with that, a uh, couple. Along with that, a couple of people are asking where they can get the PDF of the Owls Want Loving Reader from Zambia. Okay. Um, so I can, Carla, is that something that we could post on the on your website? Uh, we could post it with this video. Okay. It could get posted in the description of the video on YouTube. 
Okay, if, is that a practical way to do it? Um, it's not a big file. Um, we'll figure out a way. Okay. So uh, for the moment then, I guess the response would be, uh, yes, we'll, we'll post the, the Owls Want Loving PDF on some portion of Carla's website associated with this presentation. That sound right? Okay, yep. we can Thank do you. that. Yeah. Uh, so from Canada wrote, um, they noticed that Canada wasn't included in the myth and culture survey and they were, they were wondering if there's any specific reason Canada was not included. Um, nobody gets excluded personally. <laughs> and so uh, we, we didn't have a specific person to step forward to lead that endeavor. Uh, from Canada, and that's that's the basic reason. Um, nothing more. No. Uh, we did want to distribute our energies uh, around, but uh, at the same token, uh, getting these 200 plus interviews uh, is, is interesting and always valuable. And uh, uh, there's, there's always insights, even uh, from adjacent countries, if you will, huh? I did, uh, I suppose, 250 interviews from the U.S., and you can imagine how tremendously varied they are. Uh, and so, uh, so all the right reasons. Yeah, there's still time. If folks, uh, too late for the myth and culture publication proper, but if folks want to do, uh, conduct interviews, uh, certainly we want to help with that. Yeah. Okay. You were talking about collecting the owl eggs with uh, a black and white cloth. What was the purpose for that and for sprinkling them with flour? The, the reason to sprinkle them with flour is to have them dry. And uh, because these are very sacred objects. And the reason for the black and white checkered cloth is to make sure that the owl eggs, that you don't touch them first off. And secondly, um, you don't want them to lose any of their potency. And so it's kind of like you have to use the right stuff if you're going to handle handle these eggs. Yeah. Okay, we have somebody um, asking about New Mexico. Um, they said the modern Pueblo tribes often depict an owl that appears to be a snowy owl, a very round white owl with a spotted breast. The thing they find curious is that a snowy owl has never been documented in that state in modern times. And they're wondering if this might be a cultural artifact of magical beings that occasionally appeared in the past, or if white owls simply sell in the modern market. I think that we should be careful with the barn owl option uh, that the, the most important aspect of that is that it's an owl uh, and so that it's a so we've seen this in other places other countries too where uh, they the owl they depict is not one that's native to their area okay uh, in this in it's the rationale behind it is is that the artist the people who have made the renditions of it want it to look like an owl okay and that's the most important thing. If it's not quite the, the species native to the area, that's secondary, okay? Uh, the Museum of Art in Anchorage has a really nice, huge, ex on the exterior part of the, it is a barn owl. Well, barn owls are not native to Alaska, okay? And so th there are other examples of that. So th the thing I guess I can draw to, would draw to is that uh, the artist who, and other folks behind it uh, are wanting to articulate an owl. Uh, species correct. And it's okay. Okay, uh, do you suspect that the stigma with uh, open air wildlife markets and their link to COVID uh, will help reduce the risks for owl trading in China. Uh, do you think there will be a reduction in these kinds of markets in China? Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, the COVID is believed to start from a bat. 
and illness from stressed bats in the open air market in China. And so I think there's probably some pressure on markets uh, in that regards. Uh, the, the desire for traditional medicine and the use of traditional medicine uh, in China and other places, I think is so strong that COVID is a blip, a short-term blip in, in the aspects of it. And so, you know, here's, here's traditional, mark, uh, traditional medicine that are many thousands of years old. They're going to overcome COVID, okay? And so while I would like to personally think uh, from an owl conservation perspective that it has a big impact, um, I don't see it that way. I don't think COVID will make that kind of difference. Yeah, we need to need to think long term about how things have evolved now. Next, okay, Carla. Okay, next up, um, if you had to choose three countries that are the most important for saving owls in the world, which would they be? Ooh, how about that? Three countries. I think uh, Germany and Austria have done a particularly good job in valuing owls and uh, in, for conservation purposes. You know, it's the kind of thing now, okay, if you want to, uh, uh, Costa Rica, I think is one that I would say is probably one of the very best because they've just dedicated so much land to conservation. And from that perspective, okay, from, from protection and conservation, if, if that's one of your key criteria, criteria, and it is from an owl perspective, then that should be one of the countries, okay? Culturally, in, in supporting owls, I think that's where Austria and, uh, and Germany come into play. Uh, I can't help but recognize the Wardeman tribe and the, and the Nyingal tribe from southwestern Australia, north, north central Australia and southwestern Australia. That's not to say that Australia has done a great job, but they've done some, they've done some major conservation activities with owls as well. And so um, that's an that's a important question. Think about that in context. Uh, those are ones that quickly float to the top. I think uh, I can find heroic efforts in other places as well. Yeah. And just to kind of flip that one, I'm not sure if they were looking for ones that have done a lot of good or places where this is needed, like three countries that really are key places for conserving owls. Can you repeat that? Uh, it was, it stopped uh, free, free swing, the last part. Okay. Um, and I'm not sure if this, that's what they were getting at, the countries that have done it well, or if they're looking for three countries where it needs to be done well, where it's most important in the world right now to actually happen. I see. Um, let me take the last part of that question first. Uh, where does it need to happen? Indonesia, uh, there are biological hotspots uh, that uh, in, in the tropics and neotropics uh, in particular, where it needs to happen, where many species of owls are at risk and can be saved, you know, and can be promoted. So there, uh, and it, that fits with the larger uh, biodiversity hotspots for conservation planning. Uh, there are owls that, the, the role of owls uh, has been demonstrated to have uh, a top-down effect. If you protect owls, you'll protect the majority of the species, other species you want to protect as well. Okay, and so uh, on the flip side, uh, where does it, where could it most be benefited? Let me, the the country or the situation, I guess that stands out to me as being the most difficult for owls, is in Mali, West Africa. Mali has the highest poverty rate or one of the highest poverty rates in the world. 
the average woman there gives birth to seven and a half children in her lifespan. Four of, of those children When the child dies, the mother-in-law or an elder woman is called in to diagnose the cause of death. 40% of the time, the cause of death was the owl. And so 30% of the time, the cause of death was the wind, because who knows what can travel on the wind. And the other 30% of the time, it was dysentery, yellow fever, malaria, legitimate diseases. But 40% of the time, the cause of death was the owl. Okay, And so owls have a bad rap. Uh, there and so if probably the biggest hill to climb of anywhere for conservation and so uh, that's a significant issue and so that's current day and that's a it's a big problem so okay I hope that kind of pokes away at that question I have kind of a combination of questions that are similar. Um, why are owls considered bad omens? And um, in your research, did you find anything about owls to be true or based in fact? Okay. Um, they're, they're considered bad, bad omens because think of it this way. They're active at night. You rarely see them. When you do see them, they're staring at you. And they already have you in mind and, and so forth. Uh, the you never really know what they're doing, okay? Uh, they're spirits of the night. And so that's an easy easy thing for people who are diurnal uh, to be afraid of. And so uh, one situation in Africa when I was there, imagine the scenario that uh, the cemetery is, uh, is the only place where trees are allowed to get big because they're collected for firewood other places. So now you've got bigger trees, they have nest cavities, barn owls nest in them. At night, barn owls fly out. You see these white ghosts coming out of the cemetery. It's not a big dramatic link or <laughs> jump to assume those are spirits of people who have died and so forth and to be afraid of them. So bad omens is, is a, an easy link. Uh, okay, so uh, is any of that true? No, of course not. Uh, is there anything in the literature that identifies anything like that? No, uh, they're ecological, you know, they're biological predators. Uh, they eat a lot of mice and small mammals and insects and they're nocturnal, not all of them, but some of them are and they're, you know, and so um, they have, none of them have roles like that as omens uh, and so uh, in real life, okay? So that's a figment of the human imagination, yeah, okay. Um, what they are, though, are they are uh, they help direct, uh, like the the rodent control uh, with nest boxes that they were using in the palm oil plantations and other places. They do have an ecological bearing on uh, in, uh, insect pests or rodent pests and so forth, and so they have a a broader role for humanity in that in that sense. We would be remiss if we didn't ask the standard Harry Potter question. How has Harry Potter influenced things in the world? Uh, so, right, um, the sense is that it's easy to overinflate the role of Harry Potter, but certainly there are countries where uh, Harry Potter has become popular. Uh, well, it's all over the place. Huh? Uh, the one that jumps out is India. The, there's a demand for owls uh, that you can derive almost directly from Harry Potter. There's more middle income people in India. And when a, a daughter or son has a birthday uh, in their teenage and they would say, dad or mom, can you get me an owl uh, for a pet? And so the word goes out and they buy a, an owl for these children, uh, teenagers. And so there is, there's a relationship to Harry Potter with that. You know? um, and so um, does it, how far does it extend beyond uh, India? I don't know. Uh, we, it, you have to be careful about real effects versus perceived effects. You know? And so um, I think if anything though, the Harry Potter series has brought more attention to owls 
and the plight of owls and awareness of owls. Uh, and so I'd like to think that's all good stuff. And uh, you know, not long ago was Keiko, the killer whale, uh, and, and a few other species like that, uh, that uh, probably engendered another group of marine biologists, young bi marine biologists. And so I would like to think Harry Potter helps uh, provide a f influx of owl, young owl biologists. Have you done any research on Mayan owl dancers and Hopi owl, the Hopi owl Kachina doll? Um, the first part, Mayan dancers. No, uh, a lot of, uh, have I done work with Mayan and, <clears throat> and Hopi Kachina dolls? Uh, yes, there are some publications that talk about uh, the Hopi uh, in particular and the uh, the, and so, uh, so that material is included in the bibliography, um, and so uh, at this point, my focus has been accumulation of materials, scientific materials, so to basically identify uh, the the bucket of all, of knowledge, uh, and not I haven't gone into interpreting it. I'm not fluent in Mayan and so forth, uh, but there is a growing body of evidence about uh, the example that I gave there was spear thrower owl and, and other owls uh, involved in the underworld and so forth in the Mayan culture. Um, and for the Hopis, it's just been a, simply assembling um, more information about the Kat uh, Katina owls. For, you know, yeah, mm -hmm. it's fascinating, it's wonderful. Okay, I'm going to totally butcher this, but I have to ask it. Somebody asked if you're aware of the Welsh myth of, and I know Welsh is impossible to pronounce, um, it's spelled B-L-O-D-E-U-W-E-D-D, -D -D, the owl goddess. Yes. Um, yes, I am. Uh, and so there are some nice publications about, about it. Uh, and I have some uh, reference materials. Uh, do I know much about it? Not off the top of my head. Uh, have I encountered it? Absolutely. Um, there is a woman that is a very senior Welsh. Um, she translates Welsh and Polish and she's done a lot of work. Um, and that's one of her, one of her topic areas. Uh, and so she's, she's the go-to lady for that. Um, so I've been in contact with her, but there are some publications that talk about it. Yeah. Maybe that's not a very good enough answer, but I, that's, that's what I know. Sorry. Uh, I have a question. Uh, would you mind talking a bit about your personal boundaries with appropriating stories for education or from cultures that are not your own? And did you find any patterns in how willing or private people are with their beliefs and stories with an American, a white person, et cetera? Yes, sure, I have no problem. I see all, all of my work and the owl work that we're doing in the collective sense is that this is not about me at all. This is about uh, advancing cons owl conservation in the world. And so I am, a, I am a tiny blip in time and all I can help do is promote owl materials to others that can use it. Huh? So I don't have any druthers about boundaries and so forth. It's not about that at all. Uh, I think providing factual information is. And so I'm, I've, I, I work with that. Um, as far as with people interviewing people and their boundaries and so forth, uh, the I think it's it has more to do with the approach. Uh, when we did our interviews, we try we did purposely have to the culture or society they were in. For example, we had people from Nepal do the Nepal interviews, and and so forth. You get the idea, um, and so. But uh, my sense is that I was thankful to whoever might fill out the interview form. Uh, it's not an imposing thing. It's not a difficult thing. Not everybody wanted to do it, uh, but uh, I think uh, I had a very high percentage rate of folks that, yeah, I can do this. If you catch them at the right time, you know, if they're, 
uh, if they're in a cafe or if they're in an airplane uh, waiting room or in a bus station where they have time to do it, folks are accommodating. Uh, and so um, I don't know that I, I don't think that I'm very <laughs> imposing on folks. And so I think <clears throat> that I've had, you know, if you're gentle and kind and, and you explain what you're doing, uh, they're fun to, they, they like to participate and they like to contribute. And so I found that it's a little bit of about the approach. Um, these interviews, all of our interviews were filled out in, uh, or essentially all, um, in person, uh, on paper. <clears throat> uh, we did not want to have people fill it out online because not everybody is online. And we wanted it to be an honest cross section of people old and young uh, when we did our interview. So that was a thoughtful, uh, 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 strategic uh, aspect. And so uh, I, didn't, I didn't get the sense uh, of, of people having boundaries uh, so long as they had time to do it. We did have some pretty amazing things that happened uh, that I did not expect. Uh, one gentleman, I, he looked and he almost started crying and he filled out the form. And then when he got all done, he said, today is the anniversary of my son's death. He died a year ago. And when we were at the cemetery burying him, an owl came and landed in the tree. And it was just, I was so moved and just kind of just this wash of emotion came over me about here's a guy I just happened to interview on the anniversary of a son's death. And he was just overcome. Uh, and so we, of course, now we've become good friends and I just like talk about timing. Uh, so if anything, it draws out interesting things in people uh, rather than becomes a boundary issue. It's quite the opposite, actually. Uh, you can en engender brand new friends that you would have never, never guessed about. This question came over from YouTube, but I think it's a, a really important and relevant one for those of us in North America. The spotted owl in the Western US is often viewed as an impediment to resource extraction. What can we add to our instructional toolbox for children besides the biology of owls? Yeah. Um, we need to uh, understand that our lives are not, not driven by resource extraction. Uh, there's gotta be some safe places for wildlife in this planet. And we gain from those places as well. Uh, and so um, if, if our perspective is everything's an impediment to, to economic development, then we have our, our priorities wrong. And so uh, what can we do? I think we can talk about the value of owls, of the value of wilderness, the value of clean air, of clean water, of clean skies, uh, of, of sacred places, of safe places of functioning ecological places. There's much that we can incorporate beyond just the spotted owl as a point of conflict, okay, uh, in, in our conservation message. What we need to do is broaden that uh, instructional materials and talk about salmon and talk about fresh water and clean water and the, the role of the trees in air quality scrubbers, they're giant air scrubbers huh? uh, of mosses that they produce and the ecological diversity that they engender. And the time frame of, of, our, of our time here on earth, uh, these places have been uh, glaciated and forests have regrown and, and ecological evolution of fantastic things. And so getting a little bit more into the, the exciting, what is it about these animals that are so exciting? What is it so special about the spotted owl? Uh, it's feathers, it's vision, it's nocturnalness, it's uh, you know, the silent flight. And so other aspects that make these animals so absolutely amazing. And these places so very special on earth. So I think there's, there's a lot we can do to broaden that sort of toolkit of education to, to help advance, uh, move things beyond a discussion about uh, spotted owls being an impediment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I have a lot to say about that. 
<laughs> Next question, please. Is there more? I feel like that's a really good place to stop, actually, because we're at three o'clock at this point. Okay. Carla, thoughts? Can we do one last fun question? Absolutely. Yes. What is your favorite owl and why? Ah, okay. <clears throat> That's kind of a painful question, um, but I have an answer. <clears throat> so I'm involved uh, with the Global Owl Project in finding new species of owls and in recording all of those that we have found. Um, one of the things that we're, we've done is pull together the science that says, okay, how many owls have been described to science? And so it depends on the, spe there's 257 species uh, living. Uh, there's about 100 fossil owls uh, that have been described to science. 670 or 700 subspecies. Yeah, it gets messy. But the my favorite, and this is a personal preference, is uh, I love the spectacled owl. And I, I, you know, of course I love owl owls. But there's something about the spectacled owl just touches me like no others. And I think it's the coloration. Maybe it's the the habitat they're in, uh, their their vocalizations, uh, and so forth. But uh, you know, this is in a. I didn't have a favorite owl for a long time, but I I do now. And so, uh, if I was cast away on some place, I would want to work with spectacled owls for the rest of my days. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much for that answer. I mean, that was just personal and fun. Yeah. And sharing all of your work with everybody. Um, we certainly weren't able to get to all the questions because there were so many fantastic questions. Um, and I just again would like to thank uh, the sponsors and the people who signed up who also in addition made donations to help support this so that we can make this free for everybody and for David for giving his time to do this freely. Um, this will be saved on our YouTube channel. So if you wanna watch it later or wanna share it with other people, if you go to YouTube, type in International Owl Center and search our channel, you'll find this here and we'll share um, that other information that was requested there too. Um, our next presentation is going to be on urban barred owls with Dr. Rob Beerigard. Um, the title is Barred Owls Came to Town, A Nocturnal Predator Thrives in Suburban Habitats. So some of you may know that some owls do well in urban areas and, and some don't and uh, specific habitats and criteria are required. Um, we're hoping to continue this series throughout the, uh, the North American winter um, if those of you that are in uh, the Southern Hemisphere are having summer now, I guess, but we're kind of holed up here and closed at the Owl Center. So we felt this was just a great way to reach people um, with the generosity of our speakers who are giving their time and knowledge and sharing with those of us around the world and those of you who are financially helping us to support this to do it. So thanks and have fun continuing to learn about owls. Thank you, David. And I will end it and we'll see each other again next week on Sunday.